Okay, so today we're going to be talking all about progressions and workout progressions and how to maximize uh, your workouts, your cycles of workouts uh, to get the best possible results and to make sure that you accomplish everything you need in order to build muscle and optimize your physique progression. And that is progressive overload, perfect form and doing it over a consistent period of time with the exercises that work for you. Now, progressive overload on paper is super simple. You either add more weight or add more, um, add more load. Uh, and then there's multiple other ways, such as um, increasing or optimizing the tempo, uh, doing it with better form, improving my muscle connection, uh, multiple different ways which uh, around the topic of, of milking the weight, which we'll come on to later on this video and, and podcast. Uh, but what I wanna start with is take you through all the different types of workout progressions that will allow you to um, get the most out of your training long-term. Now, a lot of these are quite simple, but it, I find with, with, uh, with training progression that it's simple, uh, simple, simplicity always wins. But there are various hacks that you can use to optimize your week to week progression so you know how to build weight. Because one of the common questions we get asked so many times by our members is not only how do we pick the right weight at the beginning, but especially for the more intermediate, early advanced uh, members is how do we continue to increase uh, the weight and increase progressions or even know how to do the right progressions in order to uh, maximize your results without getting hurt because just adding load for the sake of uh, your ego or just for the sake of adding load is going to lead to injury and uh, stagnation and spinning your wheels but doing it strategically with with specific methods that we're going to cover today uh, is really really useful i have linked um the the article how to continue progress your workouts into the show notes and i'm going to be referring to this uh this article throughout I've got it out in front of me uh, to serve as a reference point uh, for, to, to look through today. Uh, so if you see me looking down, if you're watching this on YouTube, then uh, that's what I'm doing. So let's start off with uh, beginner progression. So we're going to go all the, way, uh, all the way back to the beginning and picking the right weight initially. How do you actually pick the right weight so you can set yourself up for success? Should you go all guns blazing or should you tease yourself in and, and work your way up slowly? Now, let's go... Um, Let's, let's take the example of a new program where you have to perform three sets of six to eight on your squat. If you've not done this before, or it's been a while, you wanna err on the, on, the, on the side of caution. And that means for the first workout you do in a cycle, you wanna, you wanna achieve three sets of eight with a comfortable one to two, one to three reps uh, in the tank. And there's a few reasons for this. The first is you wanna give yourself room to grow. The second is, you want to um, make sure you're perfecting your technique before you uh, increase your weight. And the third is to make sure um, there's, there's, um, there's no uh, risk of failure because there's nothing worse than starting a program or starting a workout cycle when you hit failure on your first workout with that because it's not going to give you the confidence to then improve upon it later on. Now, we know training close to failure is, is really important when it comes to muscle growth. But what we want to do at the beginning of a cycle is keep... One to, one to three reps in, in the tank. So your first set, let's say it's three sets of six to eight, every rep, every set should be hitting eight reps comfortably, And but you should be using perfect technique throughout and you should be using, um, you, should, you shouldn't be using, expending too much energy. Now, what this will allow you to do is over a six, eight, 12, 16 week block, is allow you to slowly eke up the load, slowly eke up the weight um, and, 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 the, and the intensity to then get the desired results, but also keep you injury free. Most, most people, when, when they receive a new program, they get super enthusiastic, they're super excited. All that ends up happening is they'll, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll, they'll uh, go all out and, and um, max out on loading. And as a result, all that's gonna happen is uh, a plateau early on. So to set yourself up for success, you want to stay shy to failure and then uh, ramp up the weight in, in slow increments. Now, you should be able to do this with a new program from anywhere from, I'd say, two to six weeks, depending on how cautious you're gonna be. I would, I would recommend uh, ramping it up quite aggressively, but only when the technique is, is maximized. And when you find, what you'll find here is as you get closer and closer to the sort of max potential, as you get closer as the weeks go by, you'll find that instead of, <clears throat> instead of it being three sets of eight, 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 it should become three sets of eight, seven, six, eight, six, six. And you'll see why we start to use rep ranges in order to um, allow progression to happen. Because what you'll find in, in most programs done well is there should be an assigned rep range where 
instead of it just being three sets of eight, it should be three sets of six to eight as an example. What that allow you to do is take the pressure off a particular number. You know, for example, if you're always fixated on three sets of eight, what can happen is you end up doing whatever it takes, um, no matter what the form is, just to hit those eight rep numbers. What can really work better, take the mind, take the pressure off, is open up the rep range to three sets of six to eight. Now, if you get, if you can get all your working sets done in those in that six to eight rep range, then by all means go for it. What many people will find is you will need to um, you will need to adjust this, and this is where things like reverse pyramiding can come into play. But we'll we'll touch on that in a second. Um, so. If your workout calls, let's use the same example, you're doing three sets of six to eight, what might happen is, over a six week period is you'll get 100 kilos for eight, seven, seven. After doing weeks and weeks of eight, 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 you then start hitting workouts where you're doing eight, seven, seven. Then the week after that, you do eight, eight, seven. Then maybe you get three sets of eight. Then, you're, then you increase the load and you go seven, seven, six. Then it's eight, seven, seven, and then it's eight, eight, seven. Now these are just random numbers I've put, I've put there which allow you to, to make that progression. But what you'll find is some people, uh, some people can, can kind of work towards the top end of the rep ranges. Others like myself, what ends up happening is my reps will always drop off on subsequent sweat sets. Uh, so even if my um, best ambitions are to get three sets of eight, it'll never really happen. Now, the exact reasons why this happens, I'm not exactly sure on the science of it, but what I found anecdotally is some people can work really well on on waiting for that last set to hit the top end of the rep range before they move up a, a, a rep bracket. Others, like myself, will only focus on that top set, on that, on that first set, to then dictate whether they should make progression. And the reason for this is, no matter what, that 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 rep drop off will always happen. And if you know that's always going to happen, you're going to be you'll you'll stop beating your head against a brick wall, thinking you need to wait for that last set to come up in order to make the progression. One thing I find this works. Um, this uh, th this really did for me is it it got me focused on just that one set and it, it gives you a level of focus that means you know you need to pull your all your maximum energy into that one set and you know the second sets even if they they fall off a bit it's not the end of the world so that's um one example I've actually got a, a workout log here that from uh, a, a training diary a couple of years ago now if you're reading the article you can see this but what you'll see oh and I'll, I'll um Definitely, definitely reference this article, but what you'll see is week one was 95 kilos for three sets of five. Nine, week two was 97.5 kilos for three sets of five. Week three was 100 kilos for five, five, four. So it dropped off. And then I thought, okay, let me go up again. Then I got 102.5 kilos for four, three, three. And I wrote brackets that felt heavy. Then the following week was 102.5 kilos, four, four, four. Following week, 102.5 kilos, five, four, four. Then I went up again because basing on that first set, you know, hit the top end of the rep range uh, of, of three sets of three to five. Went up to 105 kilos, four, four, three. Then 105 kilos again, four, four, five. And, and I wrote brackets, freak last set. I don't know what happened there. Uh, and then the last one was 105, five, five, four. So I took it from 95 kilos at five, five, five over nine week cycle and 105 kilos, five, five, four. Now some of that in the early stages of the cycle were just building up to strength potential. The last few weeks, especially, were, were realizing a lot of strength gains. Um, so as you can see, patience is the key. And there's a few weeks where you know, I stick to the workout, I stick to the, the load, I don't change it. Um, I'm just looking for those extra one rep uh, here or there to maximize, um, to, to maximize the weight before going up. And the best way to, to do, apply this to a new program is to always, quote unquote, break into a new program. And by breaking into a new program, you, don't, you ensure you don't plateau uh, too quickly. You will be working a little bit below, below your capacity, but it'll allow you to grease the groove of the movement pattern to then make uh, steady improvements as you go along uh, through the weeks. Now, I mentioned earlier reverse pyramiding. Now, if you're someone who doesn't handle weights across sets very well, a great option is to walk to your heavier set, then pyramid down on the last set. The examples I've given so far are when you stick to the same load throughout uh, multiple sets. If you're someone who doesn't handle the same weight across sets very well, then what you wanna do is you wanna warm up to your heavier set and then pyramid down. So let's say for example, uh, we've got the squat, three sets, six to eight. You might hit 105 on your first set for eight, but you know if you did 105 again, you'll probably get five or six. So to keep yourself solidly in the rep range, you'll move down to 100, 100 kilos for, for eight, and then you go 95 
the sixth day and you're probably here as well. In this example, you'll remain in the required rep range and you'll work on improving your total workload week on week. So you've got two then indicators. You've got that first set, which is the one I really like. And the second thing, if that first set doesn't go up, then you know you've got that second and third to try and beat uh, a different type of rep PB. So what it does when you when you implement reverse pyramiding, if you're someone who doesn't handle uh, weight across sets really well, is you create more opportunities for progression because you've now got that top sort of working set where you're trying to aim for a higher weight and then you've got the subsequent back off sets uh, where the focus is on um, uh, is also on it's probably more on adding reps than, than than load but it just gives you more opportunities to progress so where this is really useful particularly this this method of, of reverse pyramiding uh, is dumbbells you know a lot of people find that the jumps between dumbbells are sometimes too big you know, you're, you're going from 15 kilo dumbbell presses to 17.5 kilo dumbbell presses, which is very typical for, for a normal gym. That's actually an increase from 30 kilos all the way up to 35 kilos, which is nearly a 20% total increase. Um, and if you were to do a jump from, let's say your workout is four sets of 10 to 12. If you do a jump from 15 kilos, where you finally hit the top end of the rep range, to 17 kilos on all your sets, you're going to find yourself going from like 15 for 12, 12, 10 to like, 17.5 for eight or nine and then maybe seven and then you're like you're doing six and five and you're wondering how you're doing a different sort of workout so what you can do is to break into a new um break into a new uh, bracket of dumbbells is to introduce um a new a new weight so you might go 17.5 kilos for your first two sets where you go 10 9 or 8 7 or whatever and then you are back to 15 kilos to then finish up and keep up the volume and the overall workload. So that's a really good way to sort of break into the dumbbells. And I've used that many times when, especially with uh, smaller muscle groups where the jump can be quite big. If you go from like 10 kilos to 12 kilos on a bicep curl, that can be quite a big jump uh, to, uh, to make um, if you haven't done it before. So I've discussed uh, using the same load across sets and how to apply progression. I've discussed the reverse pyramiding. The other, um, the other approach I really like is the zigzag progression. And this is especially useful on compound lifts. And it utilizes short bursts of linear periodization, which is basically the idea of increasing load. But because it's short bursts, you increase load, and then you, and then you um, increase load, you reduce the reps, and then you repeat that cycle. So you go back again uh, and then repeat the cycle. So in this model, instead of sticking with a weight till you hit the upper end of the, the rep range, you cycle the intensity and the volume up and down throughout. So let's say your workout calls for three sets of six to eight on the bench press. In workout one, you wanna choose a weight that you can complete for three sets of eight, with each set being one to two uh, rep shy of failure. And the last set, you know, may literally be all guns blazing. And then for the next two workouts, you'll increase the weight slightly by two and a half kilos, let's say if it's a compound lift, um, which, by the way, is the only thing you want to do this on. You don't want to be doing this on, on small lifts like lateral raises or bicep curls because tr trying to increase the load, there's, there's too much of a jump unless you've got very micro progression uh, dumbbells. But let's say you're doing this for, for the bench press. You increase the weight by 2.5 kilos while reducing the reps uh, per set by one. And over the four, fourth workout, you cycle back up. Um, so, for example, a nine-week cycle could be 100 kilos for three sets of eight, following week 102 kilos for three sets of seven, following week 105 for three sets of six. Then week four, you increase the volume again, reduce the, uh, reduce the weight, but you go a little bit higher than you did last time. So 110, 102 kilos for three sets of eight, then you go 105 kilos, three sets of seven, and, and so on. And you get the, the, the gist of this. And, but over time, you're, the goal is to increase the, the load by five kilos over a nine week cycle and matching the reps. Now, of course, it never works out perfectly like this. It never works out that you complete all the reps. But what you want to do and fo you want to focus on this is making sure that you're reaching the rep target for the first two, one to two sets at least, and then for the last set, you're staying within the rep range somewhere. So, uh, for if you're doing this for three, uh, you know, rep brackets of three to five, or rep brackets of four to six, or rep brackets of five to seven, or six to eight, you can drop the rep target by one while increasing the loads by 2.5 to 5 kilos completely depending on the lift and the size of the, the progression 
If you're doing higher rep ranges in the 8 to 12 bracket, then you want to reduce the rep target each week by 2 uh, whilst increasing the loads by 1 to 2.5 kilos. So it will all vary on that. Um, and again, if you want to see some clearer progressions, just check out the article uh, linked in this description. Now, as I mentioned, the problem with the zigzag uh, progression model is that it's not applicable to um, it's not applicable to isolation exercises because of the um, because of the small the, the small nature of the muscle groups and typically the, the progression of the dumbbells. And one of the things we hear so much with isolation moves like bicep curls, lateral raises, rear delt flies, leg curls, is instead of focusing on adding a lot of load. I really think the best gains, especially for things like arms and delts, really comes from optimizing your form and optimizing rep, uh, reps and getting your rep ranges up, as opposed to trying to add more and more weight. When you go from, say, a 14 kilo bicep curl to a 16 kilo bicep curl, you'll find that typically your, your rep ranges drop quite significantly. Um, but if you focus on just adding a little bit, little bit more reps over time and optimizing your form for the bicep curl, you're gonna get more gains um, as a result of it. And I actually find with the with the bicep curls, as an example, or lateral raise, if you really hone in on micro progressions over a course of a month or two months, the benefits you see really do compound. For example, I've not hit PBs in uh, load for, for my bicep curls in ages, but I don't mind sticking with the same load, adding a rep here or there per month, uh, because I know it's, it's, it's positively impacting my biceps. When you start chasing load with these movements, what tends to happen is you bring in other muscle groups, your joints start to take a massive hit and you end up just getting either injured or just turning it into a different exercise altogether. So that's something you want to consider when it comes to um, isolation lifts. Uh, for example, if you're doing three sets of 12 to 15 on a lateral raise, you may find that you start off with five kilos for 14, 13, 12, then you go 14, 14, 12, then 15, 14, 12, and you're literally adding like a rep here and there over the course of seven to eight weeks. And then when you've hit 15, 15, 14, or if you ever get around that, then you increase the weight by one kilo, and you, re you re uh, recycle right the way back down and you start building up again. And what this does, what this requires is a lot of patience, but what it does is it'll really build muscle in these in these smaller muscle groups in, in a way that's much better than just chasing load, um, load only. And that's why in my own training, um, I've always, take an 80 20 approach where I, I, I focus on weight progression and load for my bigger lifts, but I don't really care if I make massive progressions in bicep curl, lateral raises, um, leg extensions, leg curls, etc. I'm, I'm looking more for the feel, I'm looking for more for my muscle connection, I'm looking more for accumulated volume there as opposed to uh, doing that with my floor presses, RDLs, hack squats, etc. So that's another way to use um, the uh, progression for isolation lifts. Now the next one I want to talk to you about is RPE progression. Now RPE progression is the rate of perceived exertion. Now just as a caveat because there are schools of thought that this is a really optimal way to train uh, where you periodize your progression based on the number of reps you have left in the tank. Now this is great if you're super advanced and you know what 10 out of 10 means. The reality is for most people they don't know what 10 out of 10 means and so trying to, and, and, and the same, same premise, they don't know what two out of, they don't know what two reps in the tank means. And because of that, using RPE progressions, I think uh, becomes very skewed as a, as a progression model. But I will, I will just quickly run through, uh, run it through with you, uh, for those of you interested, and those of you who may have heard about it um, before. So based on this RPE method, 10 equals maximal effort. So no further reps with perfect technique can be performed. Nine is close to all you can give with, and it will feel near failure, but it won't quite be failure. Two is when you start straining, so that's shaking. And three is when the bar speed significantly uh, slows down. So three reps in the tank. So that's 10, nine, eight, seven. And, and, and the way you experience these um, different RPE scales will depend on the person. But generally speaking, those are the way it works. Now for the most part, I think most people should be operating at around eight to nine RPE, but that's a that's a genuine eight to nine RPE when you're you're starting to strain or shake on on the last rep, or you're pretty much at failure and you know the next one is 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 going to go it's going to be hit or miss. You don't want to be doing many of those hairy reps where you're not sure if you're going to get it or not. That's I think that should be saved and that should be periodized. Um, but for for most people, that's why for most people I just say just go all out and just go towards failure because 
Most people just need to experience what that feeling is um, was without worrying about RP. So if you come across programs with RP, I personally am not a big fan of it for, for the average person. I think they should be safe for athletes and advanced bodybuilders as opposed to sort of more regular folk that we're working with because until you know what 10 out of 10 genuinely is, it's very difficult to assign RPEs on a, on a clear way. But if you are using RP and, you, and you're a big fan of it, the way um, the way you can do this is is to build up progression and intensity over the over the course of period uh, over the course of time. And something I used to do in my younger years, especially when I was more into powerlifting and power bodybuilding, is over a six week cycle I start at say two three reps in the tank, so an RP of seven. I then go RP eight, RP eight point five, RP nine, RP nine point five, RP ten, and that's like max out. Then I recycle. And if you think about it. All the progression models I've list, lifted so far are, are pretty similar in that you break in, you build up, you max out, and then you probably recycle. And some element of that works really, really well for people who have milked their beginner gains and now moving into sort of the early intermediate, late intermediate, where they're looking to get to that next level and they, they appreciate that it's not going to be the newbie gains that they used to have where you're adding weight every single week and you're making really good progression. Instead, what you'll find is you add weight, your reps go down slightly, you reach a peak and you recycle it and you go again. So I'll give one more example. If you're working in the three, uh, if you're working in the five to seven rep range, you start a cycle at seven reps, you build, build, build until your top set, your first set is hitting five. And then when you hit that five, you can try and get as much as you can. Um, at, that, at that weight, you may try something, you may try to load that then brings you into four but instead of then going down, 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 what you want to do is you want to recycle it back up. Um, so you go back to a 7RM, but your 7RM now is better than a 7RM before, even if it's just by literally one kilo. And then, and if it's not, that's fine as well. You can just milk that cycle and then go again and hope that the one after the cycle after that, you hit a 7RM, 7RM. So you can start to see now, as you move into the intermediate years, you start to play the long game a little bit more and you realize that gains will come every two to three months in the gym as opposed to every two to three days. Uh, which is a reality for many beginners. What you're focusing on here is long-term progression where you'll be happy with adding an extra rep per month, per two months, per three months. I know for me now, for example, if I'm hitting a, if I'm going for my RDL, I'm happy going from 155 to 150 for six in the next two months. For me, that's a massive win because I know the idea of going from 150 to five to 155 for five is going to take me probably six months. But it's just understanding that the, 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 the long-term progression play is, is where it's at for intermediates who, who want to build strength without uh, getting injured. Which brings me on to a really good point of uh, the case for milking the weight. So in all the progression models I've listed so far, I've given you loads of different examples. Some are from my own logbook, some are from just off the top of my head. It's never clear cut. It, it never plays out you want to, as you want to play out because Life gets in the way because stress happens, uh, recovery gets impeded, all sorts of things can cause um, cause things to fall off the radar. And whilst you should always have some level of progression system in place, whether it's adding weight, adding reps, uh, zigzag, uh, whatever it may be, the pace at which you move at depends on the person. And this is a really, really important point for anyone listening or watching to take into account because with Many mem many of our members specifically who may be super eager to increase the load or, or the reps or they feel like they have to get an extra load or rep or it's a failed session. What always happens is technique and mind-muscle connection goes out the window. This happens so often on things like leg presses, Romanian deadlifts, where it's very exciting to add more and more weight. But what you're not realizing is that the expense, the go at the expense of speed uh, that you're adding load you're sacrificing my muscle connection and you're sacrificing form. And let's say, for example, the external form looks brilliant, but the internal form, uh, and this is me making up a phrase, the internal form, which I'm referring to as a my muscle connection, that may have completely gone. You know, the, when you're doing an RDL and you can feel your hamstrings as you go really heavy one week, but then you add another 2.55 kilos too quickly, and suddenly you can't really feel your hamstrings, you can't really feel anything, and if anything, you're feeling your lower back more than anything, then you know, yes, it may look exactly the same, but internally it's not feeling the same. And the, and the, way, to, the way to overcome this, 
Uh, and the best strategy I found is the case for milking the weight. And this is milking the loads. So you stay out of weight and you milk uh, a load and even a rep, load times reps, for what it can, what, for what it's worth before you go up in reps or sets. Like there's sometimes I'll go, I'll go in the gym for three, four weeks in a row and I hit exactly the same thing. And you know, on the external facing uh, observer, some might be like, oh, you're just wasting your time, you're plateauing, so you need to change everything up. No, it's, it's, it's milking the weight. It's getting the, the muscles um, and, and tendons and joints to all integrate together because what happens is you want the tendons and ligaments to adapt to the same rate as the rest of the body so it doesn't become a future limiting factor. You know, if, you, if your muscles are getting too strong for your tendons and ligaments, you're going to get hurt. Uh, and I think one of the best ways to, um, to ensure you stay injury-free long-term is to dominate the weight <clears throat> So it feels easy, it feels like you're completely in control, you own every single inch of the rep, you're dominating the load. That's when the gains happen because at the same time, if you can make, the first time you press 50 kilos is not the same. Someone who's pressed kilos, the best way to say this is someone who's pressed 50 kilos once in their life is not the same as someone who's pressed 50 kilos for three years. The difference in the look, the strength, the control, the mind muscle connection, everything will be so different, which is why it's so important to milk the weight. And I think it's one of the best things um, you can do for your training as you enter the intermediate years, because anyway, you can place more stress on the muscle and make things harder, whether that be adding pause or slowing the tempo down or just feeling more mind muscle connection, the better it's going to be for your muscle growth. So massive, massive uh, important point to remember there is that you don't want to do all these progression models have to go at their pace that, 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 that they work best at as opposed to just forcing it because you think the numbers need to work. But that's why I don't like pre-calculated programs. And one of the reasons why when people ask me, oh, you know, what should I lift on the first weight? And what should I lift week two, then week three, when week six? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that because you've got to first maximize your form. I don't know how good your form is. Then you've got to work it up till you hit near failure. And I don't know how hard you can train. And then then you need to um, see how quickly you can and get stronger. And again, everyone has different um, different growth cycles, uh, different recovery cycles, and as a result, they're gonna have different uh, levels of, of um, improvement here. So next thing we're gonna talk about here is training to failure and how to incorporate strategic failure training for more intermediate and advanced trainees. Now, when we're talking about training to failure, there are two types of, um, the two types, we've got the mechanical failure which is when you physically can't move the weight um, any longer, form goes out the window and it starts falling back on you. So think about the person who does the, the dumbbell bench press, that last rep there, they're kicking their legs in the air, the, the dumbbells are falling back on them. That's mechanical failure and you never want to do this. You don't want to reach the point where your legs are all over the place, your form's gone out the window, the bar's returning back on you. I think that's a, it's a very abused and you, ideally don't, you want to stay away from this. And the other is a technical failure. And this is the point at which another rep with perfect technique is not possible. This is where you want to be striving for, uh, is reaching technical failure. Now, if you're a beginner, just aim for that. You got, that that's going to work perfectly for you. If you're an intermediate, you want to start thinking a bit more strategically about how much you do that. If you're advanced, you definitely want to be more strategic about that because Going to absolute failure, technical failure on a, on a hack squat is very different as an advanced individual versus someone who's starting out. The recovery demands are going to be much, much different. So if you are someone that's going super high on intensity and you're an intermediate advanced trainee, that's going to take a lot out of you. So you probably need to manage your volume and as a result, manage your frequency. Remember, it's going to, they all work on a triangle. You've got volume, intensity and frequency. If you increase one, you need to decrease another. So if you're going to go higher in intensity, which is going closer to failure, um, using more intensity techniques like drop sets, failure, um, cluster training, whatever you, whatever may have you. If you're going higher on intensity, then you need to go lower on volume and you probably need to manage your frequency to, to, to make sure it's, it's intact. If you're going higher in volume, go low intensity. And again, you manage your frequency. If you're going higher frequency, low intensity, low, uh, low volume. So you have to respect that triangle and to respect that triangle means with technical failure, if you're going to be going to technical failure, you just need to make sure you're managing everything else um, 
but I think for most people, if you're in a beginner, if you're a beginner, you just need to be working towards that. If you're intermediate then, and you know what 10 out of 10 is, then manage it accordingly, um, according to that. So really when it comes to failure, you wanna be um, careful for when your form starts breaking down and when each rep becomes a full on grind. Now you wanna stop before this and I need to keep your reps crisp and clean. Now what I mean by this is when you start doing Let's say you start doing squats, uh, you do five reps, and then from five to 10, you're taking 30 second breaks, breaks in between each rep. And main thing this is, you do a squat, you're at the top like breathing for about 10 to 30 seconds, then you do another squat, then you're breathing for 10, 30 seconds. And each set is like an absolute, absolute mayhem. And that, this is, anyone who does this, your biggest problem is not training. Your biggest problem is one that very few people will have, and it's training too hard, and you probably need to just get to the point where you keep your sets super clean as opposed to breaking it up, which we'll talk about in a second as well. Um, but a good rule of thumb is that the last rep of every set should look like the first. It should just be slower and you shouldn't be able to do another one with good form. That's, that's the way most people should be going. Now, when it comes to managing failure, uh, if we assume that everyone listening can knows how to train 10 out of 10, everyone listening knows what technical failure is, then I would say, you want to be careful of going to failure in anything in the one to five rep range. Uh, anything where you, you're not, you've not mastered the form yet, you want to be careful of that. And anything where there's a heavy involvement of your lower back, you just want to pay attention to hitting failure on, on bent over rows and deadlifts, just because the risk on, on lower back can, can, be, uh, can be very true. Again, this is assuming you know what 10 out of 10 is, you know what technical failure is as well. Things which lend itself really good to failure are dumbbell and bodyweight exercises for, for more than 10 reps. Uh, single joint exercises like bicep curls, leg extensions, leg, leg curls, uh, barbell presses for you know, six to eight reps or more. Uh, machine work works really, really well for, for failure training. So you just wanna know what you're doing failure training with. But again, just gonna reiterate for the, for the third time, only applies if you know what 10 out of 10, 10, out of 10 is. Now, Something that's really interesting to look at is the necessity of failure training for, for size and strength. Now, I'm a massive fan of high intensity, low volume training. So for me, because I train with low volume and in some workouts, I literally just do eight to 10 working sets, if that. I need to be going close to failure in order to elicit a, a growth response because I'm not putting in much volume. Now, is training to failure necessary, necessary for size and strength? I'd say you're probably looking looking at it through a straw if you, if, if you only train to failure because whilst it can lead to better gains in some cases, I think there are other things to factor in, such as total workload, total volume. For example, if you're doing three sets of eight on the bench press and your first set you go to absolute failure on, then the, the working sets after that are gonna, be, are gonna be affected. But if you pick a weight where if they're gonna be affected where you might only get four or five reps. But if you pick a weight where you get on the first set, you want two reps shy, then you may be able to get accumulate more volume at that at that load. All set so if we if you just use that same example, all sets to failure at 100 kilos on a bench press where you might get eight, six, five, may not be as good from a workload perspective compared to only the last set to failure where you maybe do 95 kilos for eight, eight, seven. You know, the total tonnage may be different. This is looking at sort of like volume equivalent lower clothes and volume um, volume prescribed sort of workouts, but I think I think the key thing when it comes to that sort of debate is accumulating a little bit more work will always be a beneficial for your size and strength, but using that first set as a real indicator can work really well. In, in getting the best of both worlds. I like to get the best of both worlds when it comes to this. And my preferred method is always go really hard on the first set, reach technical failure, but then use reverse pyramiding to accumulate a bit more volume. So for example, today I did a Bulgarian split squat. First set, I did 44 kilos for five reps. If I did another set of that, I probably would've got two or three reps. So I just dropped the load down by 10, 15% and I accumulated six to eight reps on the second set to accumulate more volume. That's a really good example of, of, um, of, of getting the, the best of both worlds when it comes to this. Now, before I finish up on, on, uh, on, on training to failure, 
I think the key thing to remember is everyone's tolerance to failure training is going to be different. Some people can tolerate uh, training to failure on every single set. Some people can tolerate just training to failure on one or two sets per workout. Again, this is going to apply to more the advanced people uh, who are listening as opposed to beginners. Um, but what I found is the answer is somewhere in the middle. If you want to train to failure, save it for save it for sort of no more than three to five total sets uh, per workout. I think if you're doing more than that, I'd question your intensity, but I'd also question whether you're recovering properly. So about three to five sets per, per workout, or if you want to make it easier, just save it for the last set of the exercise. So you don't, um, the last set or one of the sets um, of the exercise that you're doing, so you don't, you don't blow, um, you don't blow your recovery on, on it all. Good way, to exa- good way to think about it actually is anyone who's done multiple sets to failure on um, in the squat or the deadlift will know the next day when you wake up and you feel like you've been hit by a truck. That's the high level of systemic fatigue that you've accumulated and you want to watch out for that. So if you're experiencing that, you probably want to either dial into how you're using failure or dial into your volume or your level of intensity. So just tune into these variables a bit more uh, when, when you are feeling like this. Now, when it comes to strategically incorporating failure training, what I've really, um, what I really like doing here is to work in blocks and works in cycles, and I just it kind of sort of comes back to what the the progression I mentioned earlier is is ramping up. Um, it, it's a strategy I got from powerlifting. It's where you 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 build 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 and then test. And what I like to do is I like to time this for a deload. So a deload for me tends to come before holiday, tends to come before um, a break uh, or some time off. And, and that's when, when I might take five to seven days off training um, in a strategic fashion because I know uh, and my body needs it. And what I'll do the week before is just go all out, guns blazing, try and set PRs on, on every single thing possible uh, and then just go one set, to, you know, whatever happens, happens. But I like to build on it each week because once you get past the beginning gains and once the fact once you kind of add more and more load each week, then um, you need to run in these cycles and, and be a bit more strategic. So one way that can work really well is if we think we're breaking a new load, breaking in a new uh, rep and set uh, combination. You've got a couple reps in the tank first week, then you build, 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 or you slightly drop the reps as you go along. And then you do the zigzag. So whichever the progression you want to use, you use one of these progressions models. It doesn't really matter which one you use. The basic premise is build, 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 and then test, and then reset, and then go again. That works really well if you love training super high intensity, um, but you know you can't recover that well from it. Uh, it allows you to sort of um, get the best of both worlds. But what you'll find is, is over time, and there's no sign, the thing is with training, especially uh, training for body composition is there's no necessarily right or wrong and there really is a trial and error. Everyone is lit- everyone is so different with how they respond to recovery and also what they enjoy. And I think as you get more and more advanced through the, the cycles of um, of training, psychology plays a massive part in this. Is it, is it what you enjoy? Recovery plays a massive part and um, your ability to handle um, failure. I've learned over a long period of time that I hate low, high volume training. I love low volume, high intensity. I'll get bored to tears if you tell me to keep two reps in the tank every single set. I'll get bored to tears if you tell me to do more than 10 reps uh, in, in compound lifts. I love training in the sort of five to eight rep range with compound lifts, uh, going to failure, uh, only one or two sets per exercise. That sort of, uh, and training things twice a week over four workouts, that for me works perfectly. But it's taken me ages to find fine tune this. But I find a lot of people tend to fall into that bracket of four days a week training, uh, eight body parts twice a week, and then where I think, where I think, the vari- variability lies in is whether you're someone who can do th- three four sets per exercise, or whether you're someone that likes doing one to two sets. And I think the more advanced you get, the less sets you can, less sets you need to get the right stimulus. And the less sets you you'll probably be able to do because your intensity is, is so much higher, and that intensity is something you cultivate over a long period of time. And that takes me on to another thing, which will impact have a massive impact on how you recover, on how you feel, um, and how you progress. And 
for the most part, it comes down to picking the right weight. Um, you know, all too often I'll, when reviewing a, a, a training log, I'll see 10 reps written as five, three, two rest balls. Um, and if you're rest pausing your way through every single set, your progress will be cut short and you'll have a really hard time recovering. So just for those of you listening, who might want to sit, this is like when you do a 10 rep set, but you use so many breaks and you use so many pauses to get yourself to that 10, that really you've just done a re an extended rest pause. Now I remember doing a program uh, a few years ago, and it got to the point where every single set became a death set where the last five reps would literally take 10 seconds to complete. You know, I'd do a squat, wait 10 seconds, do a squat, and I was just going deeper and deeper and deeper into the recovery cycle. And it's very safe to say, I plateaued very quick, I got completely burnt out, and I could never stop sleeping because um, I was just so deep into a recovery hole. Now, the way I fix this, and this is the way I train now, and that's what allows me, this is actually a really, really important point. The reason why I can train at super high intensity and go to failure on pretty much most exercises is because my execution of the set is kept super clean. And not only is it perfect form at all times, not only are every single rep crisp, is that the last rep looks exactly like the first rep, but it's a bit slower. It's also the use of intercept pauses. And I am very deliberate with how I use these. Um, so for example, if anything less than set of six, you shouldn't, you should, you should be able to do this without pausing at the top. If you are going to pause at the top, pause it only once. Okay. So for example, on my, on my hack squads, my first set is always one set of five to seven. I would always pause once uh, in that, but that's it. That pause is three deep breaths long. That's it. Any longer then I, I stop the set and any more pauses and I'll stop the set because for me, then it just becomes an extended rest pause. Then I'm really struggling with the recovery. So anything with a less than a set of six, knock it out without any pause at the top. If you're doing six to 12 reps, then I would say pausing once or twice for a few deep breaths is okay. So I tend to like, I like twice for, for compound lifts, um, which involve the legs. If upper body, I'll go with just once. Um, but you want to do this only for compound lifts. You don't want to be doing this for isolation lifts. I wouldn't recommend uh, doing bicep curls with taking pauses at the bottom uh, or doing that with leg, lying extensions for, for triceps. I would just keep these constant at all times. If you're forced, if you can't do any more whilst keeping it constant, the set is over. And it's a really good way to, um, to reduce that systemic fatigue that you get from rest pause sets. And if you're doing 12 to 20 reps, then you can allow yourself two to three pauses if you need to be. Um, and the advantage of laying down these rules is you're able to standardize your training. Excuse me. You're able to standardize your training. I went through a phase where I'd write, oh yeah, I'm doing a 20 rep set, but the f and then I'd wait the next week and I still got 20 reps, but I didn't realize that to get to those 20 reps, it took me like an extra two, three pauses just to get there. That's fake progress. So you need to match your pauses um, as you do them as well. Now what I write in my logbook when I do, uh, when I add these pauses in, and I only really add them for legs, by the way, for quads. I think for everything else, you can just do them constantly, but for quads, one thing I always add in is um, I'll write, say six reps and then brackets are at five comma one. To me, that signals that I did the first five reps constantly and then I needed a break at the top, three rep, three deep breaths, and then did another rep. In fact, as I'm speaking to this, speaking about this, I think apart from quads, I can't think of any other muscle group you really need to use this on. Um, and I wouldn't really, I'll try and keep the rest as constant as possible with the tempo that you're using. So control eccentric, straight up again, uh, contract and then and then control again. These rules will be will make you work the muscle much harder because you won't be giving them a break, and it will allow you to manage um, your systemic fatigue. Because remember, if you're doing one set of ten on the squat with 100 kilos with no pauses, then three weeks later you're doing 110 kilos but using five pauses to get there. Is that really progress, or have you just extended a set uh, and using a different intensity technique? So that's definitely something to consider. Uh, when you are when you're building out your 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 pre programming for um, for for training. Now, on that whole topic of of recovery, uh, a really important thing which I think applies to a lot to intermediates and advanced learners. In fact, probably more advanced more than anything is the concept of deloads and the concept that fatigue masks fitness. 
Now, what deloads allow you to do in very simple terms is to dissipate residual fatigue that you've accumulated over a training cycle. Now, for novices and beginners, this is not necessary. Uh, for intermediates, I think it becomes a necessity, necessity to allow the body to keep progressing, um, as, well as, as well as a chance for connective tissues to recover. Because after the deload, you should feel great, you should be going, feeling stronger and going into the cycle, uh, next cycle. But it's very dependent on the person. Now, I think for most people who are training very, very hard, who are training all out, who aren't leaving anything on the table, anywhere between, I'd say, six to 12 weeks is a really good place to be. Um, and I say, I put that on the lower end as well, just because some people I've found to be very, they, they just need more frequent recovery. But again, this is super advanced people only. Um, I think the best way really though, is not to plan these. I don't like planning deloads in advance. I think the best way to do it is when life happens. So for example, uh, busy times at work, um, of course, bu work's always busy, so be true to yourself on that. Holidays, I think is, is probably the best one. Festive times is a good one. Um, bank holiday weekends, these are the easy ways to sort of add in deloads. I think if you're if you're feeling run down, if you've been pushing too hard to failure recently, if your joints are starting to hurt, if your appetite's starting to go, these could be some reasons for, for deload. But I'm not a big fan of uh, planning them. I think it's better just go with what your body says and, and do it accordingly. Um, I know for me personally, when my hips and lower back get cranky, no matter what I do, then it's my body's way of saying you need three to five days off. Um, what I found in the last few years is those three to five days off for me tend to come naturally uh, with, with the various things that happen. So I've not planned a deload for so many for so many years now because it's just kind of fallen into place. Uh, cool. And then the last bit I want to talk to about is the concept of auto-regulation and resetting and recycling lifts. So auto-regulation. Now this is this is an advance definitely more advanced topic um, but once you learn how to once you learn how to auto-regulate once you know how to know what to look for you can really dial, dial your training into the day-to-day -day. and you can start to use that trial and error mentality that you're doing to cultivate the the best training methodology for yourself and you begin to understand the impact of, of rep speed and style when to push when to back off how to progress from set to set so let's say, uh, let's say you need to do three sets of six on the deadlift today. Last week, uh, you did 140 kilos for three sets of six, seven reps. You're due to go up this week because uh, you hit the top end of your rep range a few times. And as you're ramping up in weight to your work set, the weight is feeling a little bit heavier. Your technique isn't normally, it isn't exactly where it is, but your plan says that you're going to do 145, three sets of six today, uh, three sets of six. Now you've got two options. Option one is you grind through the set and you risk hitting failure multiple times and potentially injury. The second is you back off the intensity and you train in a different rep range altogether. Now, number one, it should be definitely out of the question. Uh, instead, a better option here is always to choose a weight that's 10 to 20% lighter and perform two sets of eight reps here, potentially with one to two reps uh, shy of failure. That's auto regulation, and that's how you overcome bad days. You understand what sort of um, bad day indicators you have. Now, for example, for me, I know when I'm when I'm doing deadlifts, uh, as I'm warming up. Let's say I'm warming up, and I'm on my working set is 140 to 150 kilos. I know the way 100 feels and the 120 feels will determine how good 140 to 150 feels. If 100 and 120 fly up, and my grip feels strong, which is another indicator of um, fatigue by the way my grip feels strong i know i'm onto a good day if that if that 100 120 just feels heavy my back feels a bit weird my joints are feeling cranky i know it's not gonna be a good day and i know it's probably a day to just sort of back off a bit stay well away from failure and just just focus on turning up because those turning up sessions can accumulate as well and they will, they will aid, aid uh, your strength development the other end of the spectrum is if you're warming up and the weight is flying up now, you know everything you just it's literally just popping each each um each rep and you've got that 145 for, for six that you need to do then you could potentially go for a personal best now I've, I've done this a few times on new year's eve for example you know i was warming up the rdl i was feeling really really good and i just thought screw it i'm adding another five kilos 
while I didn't match the four reps I had on 145, I've got 150 for three, and, but it wouldn't have happened if I didn't just think, let me just try it, let's see what happens. And sometimes the best way is to get stronger, to capitalize on those really, really good days, uh, just to experience what a new load feels like, and uh, yeah, experience what a new load feels like, and and capitalize on it. Like these these days come here and there, so you may as well go for it. And uh, the two ways you can do it is to go up and wait and go for a personal best, and the other way is to make the last set a failure set and just go go for as many reps as possible. Both are merit, and it, com it completely. Uh, it completely depends on where you're at. And I think this is a really important point to make on auto-regulation is that this is for advanced people only and not for beginners. But the more advanced you get, the more the more you work through intermediate years, you'll start to learn when the best time to auto-regulate and when the best time is to kind of say, all right, I probably just need to back off here um, and uh, and take it easier. So, and that, and that kind of comes back to the same idea of like how to overcome, it, overcome a potentially bad day you know, when you walk into those, you walk into the gym, you're motivated to train, 15 minutes in, you know you're not, things are not feeling right. There's a few things you can do here to auto-regulate and make it a good day. First is to do more warm-up sets, to get into the groove and excite your nervous system uh, before lifting. The other thing you can do is more pump work. Like some things I love to do is, is training arms for, before legs, just because it gets the nervous system fired up, it gets the, it gets the blood pumping, and sometimes that can be all, all you need to really fire up. And, and sometimes just need to do ex you can do some explosive work again a bit more of an advanced technique but uh, you can include some explosive work to to ramp up the the nervous system the ultimate reality of training is stacking good is is really about stacking together as many decent sessions as possible um, and by learning to auto regulate you can salvage some bad se potential bad sessions and you can really take advantage of of when when things are going to be good so to finish up on, we're going to talk about plateaus and um, plateaus and resetting the bar. So if you think about all the progression models we've discussed, then there's a lot. There's a lot we've discussed in today's uh, in today's episode. If you could progress inevitably, uh, then we'd all be able to squat and bench four hundred kilos. The reality is, it's not happening. Okay, so. If you're, so you, if, let's say if you pick the right weights, you stop sets at the right time, you execute your sets perfectly, you're auto-regulating, and you've hit a plateau at 80 kilos for seven reps. I'm just picking numbers out of thin air, by the way. Uh, instead of ditching the bench press, instead of picking a different exercise, uh, because that's not the way to do this, and all you'll end up doing in, by learning a new exercise is create an illusion of progress uh, because Remember the first four to six weeks of new exercise or is neural gains. The muscular gains always come after the first four to six weeks. So if you're chopping and changing your program every four to six weeks, you're actually doing yourself a disservice and just all you're doing is experiencing a lot of fake progress. The best method that I found to work is to just reset the exercise by reducing the load 10 to 20% and working your way back up. It's been a common theme throughout this podcast is build, 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 max, reset, go. And I think it works really well. And, and I find that when I'm working at a plateau, if I'm finding myself just beating my head against the brick wall, getting the same thing over and over again, I'll just either reset the bar and bring the weight down a bit and up the rep range, or sometimes I'll dip into a lower rep range and, and continue adding weight. So it really depends on which way you want to go. But instead, if you find that after three, four, five weeks, you're still hitting the same reps and same weight, just slowly backing off a bit, um, on, on the load to add more reps can go a long way. It's like a two steps back, three steps forward approach uh, to milk more long-term gains out of an exercise instead of instead of uh, making that change. And what you'll find is when you reset, let's say you're doing 80 kilos for seven uh, example, if you go back down to 70 and for the first week you, um, you don't go to failure, second week you kind of get nearer again, but you're doing higher rep ranges, what you'll actually find is you're allowing the, f the fatigue from the previous training to disappear and you should actually see some, some really good strength gains. Um, and because, remember, you're still going to get some strength gains and still muscle gains because you're going to be training over 80% of your your 80% of your normal six-day RM. So you're still going to be making uh, good gains and when you build back up slowly from 70 again back up to 80, you should find yourself surpassing old rep PVs. That's another way to do it because remember, it's not always about your top end 
uh, rep PR, but also the rep PRs that you see uh, yourself building on uh, along the way. So this this method can work really, really well as an intermediate lifter um, to to um, to continue to make progress. And I don't think you'd be surprised how far you can take this. I, I took this, for, I did this pretty much for years, is work up to a weight, let's say 80, 70, 80 for 70 is you've maxed out, you recycle back to 70, then you're doing 70 for 10 to 12, then you come down, 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 uh, you went, so you are up, up, up in weight, slightly down in reps. Next time you're at 80, you're actually doing eight or nine reps, then you hit a plateau at 82.5, you recycle again, go, go, go up, recycle again, go up, recycle again, just keep repeating that, rinse and repeat that cycle. And it, the, the strength gains will just accelerate really, really quickly. So definitely, definitely one to, to consider and the patience will pay off. And another way to um, to do it instead of just resetting the bar is to explore different rep ranges. So if you're always in a six day rep range for the last 12, 16, 20, 24 year, you may just think it's better to now try the four to six rep range and see what happens in there. Or you can go in the 8 to 12 rep range and see what happens in there, depending on how your, your program is laid out. Ultimately, everything's going to work. You've just got to really be attuned to what you're doing and stay self-aware so you understand how your body's working uh, amongst all of this. Now, before I go, uh, so I know there's been a lot to take in uh, on this episode and I didn't expect it to go for almost an hour long. But another, just a final touch point is on indicator lifts and when it comes to training, you want to be focused on the 80-20 rule, which is that 20% of your exercise is going to give you 80% of the results. Those 20% of the exercise for most people are going to be the big indicator lifts. If your big indicator lifts aren't progressing, nothing you're doing is worth doing. So muscle building is a slow burner. Muscle building takes ages. Muscle building is not for uh, people who want quick fixes. It's going to take a lot of time, a lot of patience. Uh, like, all, like all the different progression models I've written should all be taken with a 6, 12, 24, 48 month um, view. Because remember fat loss, you're gonna see results every week, uh, over two weeks. With muscle building, a jump in the scale can mean anything, fat, water, glycogen, and maybe a little bit of muscle. So you've gotta focus on performance, and you've gotta focus on these progression models. And if you have a key indicator lift for upper body push, upper body pull, lower body push, lower body pull, then you have extra level of focus to apply these progression models that I've described in today's episode uh, to your to your training and then what you can do is you can set yourself 12 week quarterly goals to to make uh, make gains so when you go from that build 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 test mode that t- every time you test it, it it hits a new it's a new high so hope that helps I would highly recommend reading the article that comes with this it should help contextualize some of the examples I've given if you found this valuable let me know uh, it's one of the most passionate topics I have around training And uh, yeah, happy training and keep crushing it.